I was both an architect and a sculptor. So many of your clients, architectural clients, many of you have bought sculptures. But these things have never been together before. So people know one or two things, or the show, particular show they went to, but they've never seen the extent of what I've done during 50 years. So in 1973, I started my own private practice, remodeling, sedition, occasionally new houses. And at the same time, while I was waiting for clients to arrive, I had a lot of time on my hands, so I started making sculpture. I've taken art courses in college um, and in graduate school, studio art courses, but I had never done any woodwork. And I had met a friend here. Um, he had, was a woodworker, and he made simple, fairly simple cabinet work. And he got me set up with all my tools, and then I got started. But I think of it sort of like a green thumb. I just started going, and, and, and it, it just happened. I was able to do what I've done. So I never went to a school to learn uh, woodworking. So um, a lot of you haven't been to the exhibit. So before we talk about architecture and sculpture, which is the subject of the speech, um, I've already described that the two are going in parallel, and I would spend half a day on architecture and half a day on sculpture. So they influenced each other, and the sculpture became an architectural subject. You see there are a bunch of sort of visionary models and architectural fantasies, and then eventually the sculpture influenced the architecture. Um, the mural at the back of the room shows uh, my workshop, which is in the basement of my house, and the mobile to the left of me in the mural was the very first, the oldest thing in this exhibit from 1973. And this, this mobile here is the last thing that I made in this exhibit. It's uh, 2023. So they're both the same type of thing, a mobile. I think you recognize it as made by the same person. The only real difference that I see is that this is much more intricate and developed and complex um, in terms of the painting. And of course, it has various suspended parts. I want to start um, with architecture, sort of pre-sculpture influence, or at least I don't see any influence, because I was doing this simultaneously. So this, um, let me get the first, so that's an addition. Um, uh, in 1974 addition to a house in Washington. Um, and. You know, it uses natural materials and it's light in this area, but there aren't any, it hasn't really been influenced by my sculpture yet. This is a house uh, that's in Albemarle County uh, on the east slope of the Blue Ridge. The Appalachian Trail goes behind this property, and uh, that was one of the projects I'm most proud of. And you might think, well, that's, maybe it's a Frank Lloyd Wright influence piece of work with these cantilevered uh, balconies. Um, there's a, a big valley going in this direction, a subsidiary valley coming in at right angles and right angles, and that projection looks down the subsidiary valley. Um, that's another view of this house. Um, uh, and then this is the inside of the house. Um, there is a sculpture in the house, so the clients brought a sculpture. That's called Space Schooner. It's the name of that. Um, that's just by way of showing you stuff. You'll see later on that the sculpture and the architecture became much more integrated. So, so there are various parts of architecture that can become subjects of sculpture. Entrances, for instance. Um, as, as a process that you go through when you enter a building, or, or, or gateways to things, like gateways to zoos and towers, and those are easily developed as, as sculptures. So this, this is contemporaneous, it's 1970, it's a little later, that's 1978, but this is a sort of imaginary entrance to a building. <laughs> 
and I just started designing something, which I often do. The only thing that I knew I was doing was designing an entrance. I didn't know for what, to what purpose. And then afterwards, I find something that it reminds me of, um, and I believe that all my subconscious experience is sort of it is coming out, and you can find references to my experience. Now, this one I call aquarium entrance. There's really no logic to that. Um, and you know, you have these sort of small and practical doors, and you have a, a lobby plot behind, and then this sort of sculptural uh, projection underneath the canopy. It could have been probably named anything else, but I wanted the title to suggestive or something. So now, this one uh, is. Um, This one is called Headquarters Building. This one is a little bit sat satirical, because it shows an office building, people working in an office building, and sort of a liftoff or a rocket-like form that's going up through the building, emphasizing the verticality of the building. This was owned by the Washington Post for a while, and I don't think it's there anymore, I don't really know where it is, but, um, it, it's an architect, clearly an architectural subject, and I see it as sort of having making fun of bureaucracy. So this is called elevator lobby. It's similar to the, the one before, and you again have a sort of lift-off scenario with stages of a rocket going up in a very high um, uh, a lobby, a you know, multi-level lobby with balconies uh, um, overlooking it. I wasn't thinking specifically uh, when I made this of a rocket or lift off or anything, but looking at it now, it seems to me it's influenced by that. Um, so this one is in the show, um, and th this one is called the Steamship Authority. It's in the back room. Um, let me ask from the audience if anybody has an idea. Well, this is inspired by a specific place, what it might be. Martha's Vineyard. Vineyard. Yeah, so in Martha's Vineyard, in Woods Hole, there's the Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket Steamship Authority. You know, it sends these boats out to the magical islands and the adventure of having a vacation in a beautiful place. But at the time, they had a very, very pedestrian building. It was just a little administrative building, just a sort of blocky building, very unimaginative. So I said, maybe we should dress it up some, put the front of one of the ferry boats as a canopy, um, and invite you to the romance of going on a ferry boat to the islands. Um, these are all still entrances. They're still in the, the entrance category. Now this one, I designed an entrance with no idea what it might be, um, but I decided that it might be good for an embassy. So I, I call this embassy entrance. It also could be an entrance to a fashionable woman's clothing shop. And the design would be their mark. In other words, you wouldn't need any lettering. You just know that's the place to go get your, your, your special clothing item. Um, and this one uh, I call theater entrance. And like the others, there's a sort of a white facade with an entrance, but this also has the suggestion of office buildings either side and something on the top. So it's, it's sort of in a super block of some kind and you're going into an entrance. Um, this one is actually a specific, made for a specific place. My art dealer, Christopher Addison, uh, who's the curator of the show, uh, uh, had on Hillier Place, that was the gallery that he was, that's where the gallery was at the time, and it was a simple brick facade, and I thought I would design an entry for that, Un unsolicited, by the way. He didn't come to me and say, you I just, what if? This, this is a lot of what I do as well. So that's just a gallery entrance. 
I also designed a uh, reception desk for the gallery. Um, now this one, um, yeah, we're still in entrances. This, this one I call the Great Hall, and it's like a huge dining hall or assembly hall, and you're looking at one end, and you can see it fits into the corner of the room, so it would go into the right angle of the room. It could be up high or in the middle of the wall. And um, here you have sort of a service entrance and maybe a pass-through and a couple of columns. Yeah, maybe that's to the dining hall. I mean, that's where the food is served. I don't know. That's a bizarre sort of sculptural thing, again, hanging at the top. Um, um, so now, um, all those are architectural fantasies. They would never be built. I mean, some of them uh, conceivably could be built, but they're not really built to be practical. So then we're going to look at gateways, which is another architectural feature that I enjoy playing with. So this gateway I call a gateway to a college campus. Um, you're seeing, it's sort of like a walled city. You're seeing a, it's cut out of, of, a, of a wall that would surround the campus, and there's steps up to the main gateway, and there's a tunnel through at a lower level and steps up to a another gateway going in a different direction. So it's a it's an entrance. So then you might ask, well, what does that symbolize? Because everything has to symbolize something. I mean, particularly when it's attached like this so prominently to an institution. I don't know what it symbolizes, but maybe the intellectual life, it's all in your head and your imagination, and uh, it's all, everything is possible, thinking, doing, being. Uh, so, now this one is in the show. This is gateway to a public art. This is more closer to something that could be built. This was influenced, I believe, by a trip we took to India in the 70s where all the voluptuous curving forms of Indian architecture and art, I think, had an influence on me. Um, and as you can see, benches where you enter uh, through this gateway and the benches to sit. Um, on either side, um, but the anticipation of a destination going through a gateway is, is a basic architectural uh, process that's quite exciting to me. So this is called Parrot Field, totally invented. That says Parrot Field, but it's, you're looking at it from the other side. You enter from the left and go through turnstiles here. So this would be an entrance to a stadium. If you're going to a stadium to see something, and you go through the gateway, which is, gives you a lift. Um, and these are lights, that, and weather vanes and flags, lights that light up and light down. Um, and there's even a sort of a trademark PF, like you'd have a branding of a team or something. So again, totally um, imaginary but fun to think about. So now the third category is towers. So this one uh, is sort of even more, you could say, outrageous. Let me turn my page here. Because I call this one uh, scenic overlook. And the idea, pretend idea, is that this would be in a range of large mountains. You can see it's anchored on rock, and you would either climb or drive up to the rival spot here. Then you could walk up these red stairs to an observation platform, and which goes 360 degrees and look out at the surrounding mountains. And here again, you have a big symbolic thing on top. So what does it represent? I mean, it's obviously man-made in, in contrast with a natural setting, but it does seem to suggest to me anyway, again, space exploration, which might be the mark of our uh, civilization. We're working so hard uh, on, on exploring outer space and trying, uh, if possible, to live in outer space, which seems unlikely to me. But anyway, that was an idea. Um, and I don't think, I didn't start out to make it that way. I looked at it afterwards. 
I knew the setting, so I guess when I was designing it, I knew what I was going to think of it as. So this is a lifeguard platform, a lifeguard chair. Going back to Martha's Vineyard on the beach, uh, we rented a house there several years. There was a lifeguard chair with battered sides and a chair sitting up there, so storage under the battered sides. And lifeguard gets up there and looks out over the ocean, of course, at swimmers. And this is sort of a, a monumental sculptural version of a lifeguard chair, and it's totally impractical because lifeguard has to climb up that high and, you know, take a while to get down, and meanwhile, somebody's grounding. <laughs> anyway, it even has two levels. There's a, a thing up at the top. So I saw it as a sculptural object. There's, um, this is a non secretary here, but there is a cross sculpture in the other room you might want to look at. Just very briefly, I saw a beautiful cross in a church. It had no religious significance, only aesthetic. It was beautiful, and I wanted to deal with it as a subject. Um, and I ended up calling it Urban Cross because it reminded me of settlements and traffic and human civilization and non-sectarianism. That was an aside. So this is the same idea as the earlier one, but this really would be in a resort, say in Hawaii, in a model, um, maybe in the South Seas, um, overlooking the ocean. And customers at the resort could climb up and sit on an elevated perch looking out over the ocean. There's another one on the other side, and it's a very decorative canopy. So I'm going to transition now because I've always loved landscape, natural landscape. And we've traveled a fair amount in Australia. We took a lot of canoe camping trips. And um, I made sculptures of landscapes. Um, and this one is an Australian scene. Um, there is Ayers Rock and a group of mountains called the Olgas in central Australia. And they don't exist side by side like that. But I wanted to make a sculpture of the landscape, which I, this particular landscape. The reason I'm showing you natural landscape is that I get into urban landscape. So we're going to see the architecture become a subject of landscape. So this is a cloud, thunder cloud formation. The Aborigines and nomadic people, um, when they gave birth to a child in a specific place, that child would become associated with that special place, maybe take on its name, and become part of its identity. So there was even the thunder cloud god, and you see the eucalyptus trees, the white eucalyptus trees there. So this is another landscape which is, nobody would guess this. In other words, a lot of the stuff is just in my head. And, and, but I, what is interesting to me is people see all sorts of different things in, in what I'm doing. And I see different things, but the emotion, the feeling is always the same. In other words, even if you don't know what it is and you have to decide, you still have the same feelings if you did know what it, what, what it was about. So this is actually an impression of the Kincaid River in West Virginia. We do a lot of canoeing. We canoed this river, uh, this river many times. There's a place called Cardi's Castle where the rock strata have gone up vertically and you have a sort of tower-like formation. It's called Cardi's Castle because he was a settler, and the story is, maybe it's mythical, that he'd go up there to defend himself when the Indian, when the Indian uprising, um, and so he'd come down after the left. <laughs> so you see a river in rapids, a river's going around the corner. Um, so here is a combination. This was a commission for the Spring, uh, Franconia Springfield uh, um, uh, what it is, it's um, Nova, you know, I call it Nova, Innova Sculpture. So it's the Innova Hospital Center at Spanconia, Springfield. So I got a commission to do something. So I decided to do a landscape, but with a building in the landscape. See, there's a river coming down, there's a road that comes up to the entrance to this and then it continues on into the mountains. So the idea is that this would be a health 
probably a recuperation, a rehabilitation, or mental health center set in the mountains. So I actually invented an architecture for that. So now we're going to go to urban landscape. So I did a series of sculptures based on Manhattan. Um, this one's called Downtown, and there's Midtown, and then there's Uptown. I try to encapsulate a little bit of the character of each place. And in each one, there's a subway stop, a sculptural subway stop. So this is the subway stop. The stairs go down. Can um, everyone see? I, I may be mocking people. So, um, and you see sort of cast iron, the hint of cast iron facades, which are in, in Soho, in the uh, downtown. Well, this is Soho in my mind. I call it downtown. Um, so you have this, you know, uh, unique. In the other room, you'll see there's a subway canopy that they designed for our neighborhood. So that that's sort of an idea of that for a while. Um, this this again would never happen. And can you imagine having a subway stop like that? Or who would agree on it? And if it was a commission, every artist in the world, the famous artists, would want to get it. So you know, it's just again, it's pie in the sky. But I'm having fun with this stuff. So that is, this is Midtown. So in Midtown you have more sedate office buildings, again a subway stop with stairs going down. Um, but this is uh, in a sort of a patio or a plaza which is tucked into a building. Very high buildings with stairs going up to the roof. Um, uh, just sort of a different aesthetic. And this is, is Uptown, where you have more like Fifth Avenue and sort of more aristocratic flavor. Uh, again, a subway stuff. Uh, now, this is um, a, a, a sort of a super block, imaginary super block uh, in the city. This is called Entering the City. And, um, you have sort of an older building encapsulated um, in, in a larger structure. You have a big portal that goes into the interior of the block. Um, I think that is something that I forgot to mention. Le Corbusier, the French Swiss architect, who was my virtual mentor. Uh, I loved his work. He did very sculptural architecture. He used uh, primary colors. Um, he, he made, um, he was a painter. He actually designed sculptures that a, a Scottish woodcarver made in Scotland and mailed back to him, and then he would paint them. So in a way, he gave me permission at the time when I was starting as an architect to head off as a sculptor, too. Um, so at Chandigarh in India, where he designed the capital city, um, there's a courthouse, and there's a big sort of entrance. So I'm pretty sure that was what influenced that. Uh, Um, now this is a commission, um, and I think uh, the Howells, no, was it the Howells, let's see, no, who was Reeves, who was, where's my wife, who was the one that I, oh, uh, McDaniels, yeah, Bill McDaniels, um, he's not here. So, but his wife commissioned me to make a sculpture for her husband for his 60th anniversary or 50th anniversary. This is a depiction, an imaginary depiction of Farragut Square. There's Admiral Farragut <laughs> and the park. And then this is the bar building. Um, a lot of lawyers have offices in the bar building, and this is an attraction of the bar building, including her husband. So he would be in this office looking out over this. So I thought I'd do an impression of where he worked. Now, this, I think this is I Street, and I forget, but anyway, this is a corner that's been folded back. Well, these buildings are still there, and this one actually is a resemblance of the building, there, but it was facing in like that. So I, I folded it out so it would be flat against the wall, um, and then this is in his office. He's no longer in the bar room, but, you know, and he's in a different building. But, so clearly, architecture became a theme uh, in the sculpture for that. Now this, I call intersection. This is also the law office. Totally abstract, but for me, 
It represents circulation in the city, uh, road circulation, intersections, um, a lot of things happening in the urban environment. You, maybe you're familiar with the Mondrange Broadway Boogie Woogie. It's wonderful. <laughs> so this is sort of, I, not, I didn't think about it when I was making it, but as I look at it now, it's sort of my version of that idea, the city uh, traffic life. Uh, there are mirrors. You can see mirrors in this incorporated, which reflect the back pieces of the letters and also whatever else is in the drum. So now we're going to more specific architectural, sculptural proposals. We live in Cleveland Park, and I decided, uninvited, unsolicited, to make some suggestions for Cleveland Park. <laughs> so this is a subway stop, I'm sorry, a bus stop designed for Cleveland Park. You have, you know, Cleveland Park, um, it it's, it's, would be difficult and expensive to make. It would probably have to be cast fiberglass or maybe metal and have powder coating or some permanent finish. But that is the current stuff. <laughs> so, you know, now people that I know in the neighborhood, well, they should do that. They, they notice, they, they feel good about it. But I, I have never, ever won a public commission. I, I've, I've tried many times. I think the reason is they're all public committees, and it has to be the lowest common denominator. And any, anything that is too high profile, that's that's going to be a problem for people. Um, there's, there are exceptions. I'm just I, I've just been thinking about this. The Sydney Opera House was actually a commission, and Errol Saarinen was on that board. And the story is he arrived late and everybody else on the board had pushed all the designs aside, including Gordon Utzen, who was the, I guess, Danish architect, I think, who, who designed it. So, because um, Saarinen was so well known, he said, that's it. And everybody agreed, and they built it. Hugely expensive, ran way over budget, major structural problems. The architect was fired. But it's, it's worth every single penny because it represents Australia. I mean, people don't go to Sydney, but go to Sydney because of the Opera House. And it's just one of these examples, rare examples, where a commission can really reward a uh, outstanding and very unusual project. <laughs> so uh, this is my proposal. This was a competition for the standard canopy. Um, that you've all seen on the subway stations, covering the escalator going down. And um, you, you know the one that was picked. It, it was very, um, very good, very functional, um, uh, and serviceable, but they're all the same. And, you know, it's sort of an expression for me of a bureaucracy. Um, I, I entered this competition knowing that I would never win. But I thought it'd be fun to think about it again, what if? So this could be, although hugely expensive, and it would not be made out of powder coated steel and things, many pieces assembled, you'd only have to change the name of the station each time. So that's, that's the Cleveland Park Station. See, I'm having fun with my neighborhood. Now, we have a post office. That's our post office, Cleveland Park Post Office. And at the time that I had this idea, they were proposing a renovation to the post office. So I decided that I would propose <laughs> a different sort of renovation to the post office. So you can see structurally, there are three large bays and the columns, so the structure wouldn't change. But the whole effect would change. You can see again, flags and weather names, the name of the station, these are telephone booths. We still have telephone booths there. Uh, and my thought was, well, this would be a wonderful, exciting, fun place to go to. And you could even have tables where you could uh, sit down and there'd be music and you could pra practice cursive writing again. And even new alphabets, really beautiful, beautiful alphabets in all different languages. So, sort of, you know, again, anti bureaucratic thought. <laughs> Now this is one more project in Cleveland Park. 
gun in advance you can, because this is the corner of Ordway Street and Connecticut Avenue, and it's the Park and Shop Center. And you can see there's sort of a nascent little group of, of park picnic benches and seats here. And my thought was to make this a plaza in the corner, give up a few parking spaces, and make it a place to sit and wait, uh, and it, as it's already used, but in a, in a much more interesting way. So that is what I proposed as a tower, Genesis Towers, on that corner. Um, to sort of mark the corner, there's no landscaping here or extent, but that was the thought that there'd be something on the, on the, on the uh, corner that would be uh, in the center. Um, you sort of standing up here, and then there'd be some seating and landscaping um, as an idea. So this is the one project that was built. <laughs> and this is Macomb Street Playground on, on Macomb Street. And this had a, a singular uh, reason for being built. There was a committee of neighbors who raised money to improve the whole playground. And one of the neighbors, a friend of mine, suggested since I lived in the neighborhood and was an uh, architect, artist, that I designed something for the playground. So I decided to design a gazebo with a seating pyramid or under shelter where nannies or parents could look out in all the different directions that their kids playing and supervise them. And, you know, uh, so uh, uh, a woman made a major contribution uh, when I proposed this idea uh, to make that happen. And it was built. Um, this is what happened to it when the district came back and remodeled it. They took, first they wanted to cut it off and move it towards the street as a sort of a beacon or a, a marker for the entry. When they realized they couldn't do that without taking it all apart and rebuilding it, they said, okay, we'll leave it there and we'll build it back exactly as it was. But they didn't do that. They eliminated the raison d'etre of this thing. They eliminated the seating pyramid. The seating pyramid. So it sits in the middle, it's still visually uh, there, but functionally, it's lost its function. Um, now, I didn't stop at Cleveland Park. I made suggestions for the whole city. So this is uh, the Smithsonian building down on the mall. It's changed now because with the new museums, the neoclassical model has been abandoned with the African Museum, the Indian Museum, uh, but the insistence of the neoclassical really bugged me. So um, this, of course, is, is Romanesque and is uh, much more romantic. Um, and this one, you remember, there's a carousel. I think, I think it's being repaired now. Yeah, the Art and Industries building, a carousel, and over on the left is the refreshment kiosks that they built, a series of them for the mall. When I did my project, which you'll see in a minute, there were trailers up on blocks that were the refreshment kiosks. I mean, they were temporary. Maybe you remember those. That's probably in the 70s, that's when it first came. So, um, I thought that I would design something in the spirit of the carousel and um, also the um, what is the annual spring uh, fair they have yeah, up down at the Mall Festival? It's a folklore festival um, and the Romanesque building. So this is a proposal, and there's another picture. Uh, this is looking up at it the other side uh, for a refresh typical refreshment kiosk. You'd have a, a menu board, a window, and then you'd have this fantastical pavilion. This would be clear story glass. And you'd see the underside of the structure and the lights that shine down and some very festive, very anti neoclassic <laughs> Of course, wishful thinking. Okay, so this one, does anybody need to guess what this is? 
Th this is a proposal for the Gallery Place Chinatown Metro. And you're underground, and that's the wall. The trains are running either side of the platforms. The train is in the middle. The, the natural wood piece has lights that light, light it up, and it acts as a chandelier in our dining room. But the idea was to put Gallery Place Chinatown, your destination Chinatown, exotic oriental self, including the arch in Chinatown, and the galleries. It's an access to wonderful art and art galleries. What better place to announce in the subway stuff? This is all about uh, art and uh, you know exotic cultures and so on. Anyway, so again, this would never get built because it'd be too much in your face, I think. And if it was a commission, you'd have every famous artist in the world wanting to do it. You know, so is, this is replaying with this stuff and having a good time and suggesting the ideas. So it reads from both sides, it says, Gallery Place, welcome to Metro, Gallery Place, Chinatown, and from both directions. So from either end you can read it, and from either side you can read it. That's the station. This, um, I'll pass over this quickly, because this was a comp another comp public competition for, I think it was, uh, um, Boston or one of these uh, uh, the developments on that string of subway stops. Uh, I think it's the, uh, uh, let's see, goes out in Virginia. <coughs> Turn my page. Uh, yeah. yeah, Clarendon, I think. Um, and the developer was looking for a sculpture in the plaza. So, so this is a kiosk. Um, it's a functional kiosk, and you can read whatever is posted, and you have lights going down and lights going up and weather vanes. This is another proposal for, wasn't, that wasn't selected. This one, um, uh, this corner, um, let's see, I think it's M and Connecticut, where Rhode Island is coming in. And there was a site there for a sculpture. So I decided to make a tower. This is sort of my idea of a Hyde Park corner. So you have a platform. People get up and theoretically give talks about what they believed in. And this is, a, you know, somebody selling the freshness. Um, that was not ever built. Um, this is the model. And somebody has bought the model as a sculpture and has it. Now, this one is the Connecticut Avenue entrance for the National Zoo. Um, let me advance the slide, because that's what it looks like now. Very low levels, you have the end of two flagpoles. You could drive right by and not even know it, unless you're looking hard that it's a zoo. So my thought was to build a big gateway that would announce the wonders of the animal kingdom um, and the exotic exoticism and so on. Um, and you would come through, these are the, uh, the street is out here, these gateways. You had the option of going up stair stairways hidden behind these pink abutments and crossing a bridge in the middle. So you could go up there and look out at the stream of human animals coming in under you to see the wild animals. And you'd start thinking, is there really a difference? You know, a different kind of. Wildness, maybe. <laughs> um, okay, this, we're going uh, even further, maybe. This, this is called Tower Weather Vane. It's a fiberglass weather vane on a tower. And this is the old National Airport with the suggestion you could have a monumental weather vane to flight, which would rotate around. Uh, that's the, like, the old. Uh, Airport building. Uh, so now um, I'm getting to the point where the, I think the architecture and the sculpture uh, merge in the real world in the built environment. This is a house um, that's on Rittenhouse Street, uh, just off Nebraska, before Oregon Avenue. It was a house that I designed, and it was for art collectors. 
that had come to my house to see my studio, and when they learned that I was also an architect, said right away, when we get our inheritance, we're going to ask you to build a house for us. So about a year later, they called, and I was trying to remember who they were. But anyway, it was a bizarre proposal. So we went ahead, um, and this, uh, there are three towers on top of this building. This is just one shot. Um, the husband had his office up there, his study. The wife had her stained on his studio. And the third one was for an elevator. And this is a stairwell inside that house, which twists up and around. And it's chock-a-block with art now, but at the time it was finished, it was fairly um, uh, pristine. But I really feel like I was given permission by the my clients, and they did agree to do all this, that it could be very the sculpture uh, as well. This is a house in Forest, uh, not Forest Hills, in Wesley Heights, which has two large cupolas on the top floor. Um, it's sort of a Dutch gable house. That, it was really a new house. We rebuilt the existing house. On this top floor, there are his and her studies and the stairwell that goes down. And then on the uh, glass division between the two studies. And then you can see that the cupola is painted. And there, I use color in other parts of the house as well, um, uh, uh, different colors. This is a beach house. And, uh, yeah, actually, we're. We started it too. Okay, well, I'm going to finish up soon. I'm going to take a longer. Um, this is a beach house in Lewis, Delaware. There's several shots of this. This is the bathroom on the second floor. Um, and there's, um, you look out through a two story space to the outside, and then there's a cupola with um, uh, light coming down in the middle. On this floor, there's a master and a bathroom. That's the view out through the cupola to the uh, master bedroom. Um, so this, for the same client, is a, a, a kitchen addition. Uh, and you can see that, again, a cupola with light, brightly colored, wood ceiling, lighting boxes, and so on. So there are definitely sculptural effects here. This is a gazebo. It's called Wendy's Folly. The person who commissioned it is named Wendy. In the backyard of Cleveland Park, and a um, place to sit in the garden, and there's a little shelf for a bottle of wine and a couple of glasses. <laughs> as far as I know, it hasn't been used for that purchase. I keep proposing it. <laughs> this is our own kitchen in Cleveland Park. Um, I didn't make the cabinets. I painted the, the poles in the cabinets. I helped ceiling. This is a basement apartment um, near St. John's High School, the college high school, um, McKinley Street, I think it is. Um, and the wife really didn't want any bright colors on the first floor. So the husband took pity on it. He said, well, you go do the basement. So we made a basement apartment, uh, decorative ceiling, you know, construction, constructed, non-structural, network for the colors. Then they, this is not just purely a sculpture, but they did commission me to do a sculpture for the backyard. There's a light in there that glows in, in the dark at night. Um, this is another, this is a basement apartment. Um, uh, this is in Lafayette School area. Um, and a very intricate uh, ceiling in which there are coffers and stripes of color um, so that the whole uh, ceiling takes on aspects of the sculpture. Um, this is the last slide. Um, and this, uh, if you look at the video in the back room, um, there's my clients. I did an addition for them. I proposed using color. And she said, OK. They went away for the weekend. And I, I had this whole color scheme executed, and they came back 
and she called me later that night. I can't stand this. I've got to change your mind. Don't worry about it. Just let it there. Let it sit there for a couple of days. Maybe you'll change your mind. Sure enough, the next day she calls. Oh, I love it now. <laughs> then she proceeded to paint the whole rest of her house bright color. So if you have time, look at the video, and you'll see she's she's like swept away by this whole thing. So it's a great compliment. Um, so that's it, and I have time for questions. Yeah. Your colors are so vibrant, they're amazing. And I, I wonder if you've ever tried 2D painting, or there's no need, basically, with your colors. But with the models, I was curious, do you build something out of wood and wait and then color it, you know? Or how does it work? Put your colors in. So I think, the, I think the question is, how do I arrive at the color scheme? Do I build something and then color it? And the answer to that is no. I you know in typical architect fashion, I pre-thought pre as much as possible everything out ahead of time, including the color scheme. Because in architecture, you can't change course in the middle of a project while you're building it. It's too expensive. You know, that doesn't happen. So I'm in the, ma I'm in the habit of trying to preconceive as much as possible. So I do... Um, I do a design over in the sculpture, overlay it uh, with tracing paper, and experiment with different colors, and again from all sides, you know, and cross sections. So it's all figured out ahead of time. And if I get started and I'm not happy with it, I usually abandon the project because uh, I might modify the colors, but I pretty much have it all uh, visualized before you. Another question? Yeah. Was Dr. Seuss a childhood influence on you? <laughs> the, the question is childhood influence? Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss, the childhood book. Oh, Dr. Seuss. Well, um, I don't, I love Dr. Seuss. I don't remember, like, modeling myself for Dr. Seuss in any way. Um, and as to where any of this comes from, your guess is as good as mine. I just start sketching something and picking colors. And, Really, that, that's where, I mean, I, I don't dream in color, I don't dream sculptures in that. <laughs> yeah. Just a comment. I love how your your works throw shadow on the wall, yeah. how beautiful your shadows are reflected uh -huh. in the work. Really neat. Yeah. Yeah, well, the lighting, this, um, I haven't talked to all of you about it, but the charcoal color of the walls was a given here. Somebody three exhibits ago wanted a charcoal walls. And when I first saw it, the director said, well, you can paint it white if you want to. And if you want to paint it, have it painted white. Then I thought about it and I said, well, maybe it would be a plus, because all these things might be picked out with spotlights. And that's exactly what happened. And part of the, the alum of this exhibit is because of the charcoal walls and the spotlight. Anything else? Well, um, right here. what uh, what wood do you usually work with, and um, why do you work with that specific wood? Okay, raise your hand. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, it's Yemen, right? Yeah. So, what wood what do I usually work with, and why that specific wood? Most all of the wood. Well, there's a lot of plywood here, but most of that is painted. The the, the principal wood is poplar. And I work with poplar because it finishes very well, it finishes smoothly. Like oak has a pock surface, you can't really paint that successfully without filling all the pores. Um, and also with poplar, it, it's quite common and you can get it in large dimension. If you want it, it comes, it comes up to three and a half inches thick. So I can't use wood that logs, that, you know, from trees that are falling because I, I can't incorporate erratic cracks and knots in my work. It's just not that kind of uh, thing. But with the poplar, they can kiln or air dry that. Um, and so I can get large pieces of wood without have showing lamination marks. Yes? So what's next? What's next? Um, that's a good question. Um, I've, got, I've been doing a lot of mirrors. And actually, I got, I've done many mirrors. I've probably done 50 or 60 mirrors. But two or three exhibits ago, my art dealer, Christopher Addison, 
there was a small mirror that I had that I had sold. He said, well, I think I'd like something like that for my granddaughter. So then I started designing more mirrors. Um, I, I haven't really talked to him about why he hasn't come back, but that be that as a bit. So I now have a whole lot of mirror designs <laughs> that I'm still executing. I recently got a commission for some people in Washington and a, bought an apartment in South Portland um, overlooking Casco Bay. And we looked out at Casco Bay, so I decided that should be the theme for the mirror. So I have now five or six different mirrors with Casco Bay as a theme. The first one is called On a Rising Tide. And you see sort of bubbles coming up and the tide coming up. Then there's one called uh, Chop, where you see a lot of choppy water and chop. Um, there's um, one called uh, Surf's Up, where you have a lot of you know, vigorous activity going on. Anyway, I, I tend to think in series of things. Um, so I, I sort of develop different ideas. I even have one Casco Bay in winter. Now, whether I'll build all these, I don't know. But what I'm doing is that right now. Yeah. Have you ever gotten commissioned by um, uh, building developers to put something in their uh, entranceways? Because many buildings now have some kind of artwork. Yeah. And yours would be a natural. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Don, you have something in your uh, office there, the American League of Cities. Uh, I think that's the only, only one. Uh, for some reason, no, I have an employer's office. Uh, lawyer's office is that gateway to a college campus at the uh, Association for the Advancement of Science. That's in a window. I think it's on I Street. You can see it from the street. And they have an art collection in there. Um, but by and large, I haven't done a lot of public collections. I'm uh, uh, proposals. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should. It's one more. It's here. almost an hour now. So one last oh, one, one here. More? Yeah. 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 As for architecture, have you done anything besides houses, or are you just mainly residential? Anything uh, besides houses? Oh, good question. Um, no, uh, I, I I haven't actually described. Um, I came to Washington to work for a firm. It was a huge disappointment. They were looking for a designer to bring the firm out of the was sort of an old guard firm, and the, most of the architects had come up through the apprenticeship system, and they really couldn't manage it. I mean, I was hired to change the design, and he couldn't use the, the guy that hired me couldn't use my design, so I was very frustrated, and I had to leave right away because you know I was totally non-productive. So I decided I had to become independent and open my firm as soon as possible. And I, the, the man that I mentioned who got me started in woodworking and I bought the tools uh, became my first partner. It was a brief partnership for maybe a year or so. But um, I really, in between the official world of architecture and the official world of art, because um, you know I, I don't really know many people in either either uh, either community. I, I'm, I've always worked alone, no employees, and half time on each, and that's been satisfactory for me. I, obviously, I have I can only work on a small, beautiful kind of because I can't do larger projects. But nothing's too small for me. <laughs> um, well, maybe it's now almost an hour. If you have extra time, I encourage you to go um, and see the exhibit, and I'll hang around when I have the Thank you.